because then that's sort of like left to interpretation. It is, it is. So a maximum of half an hour then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, is that better? Is that yeah, good, guys? Yeah, you agree. We're in agreement. Right. All right. It's fantastic. We've got had a good relationship with Rafa and, and his wife also, who's done uh, quite a lot of stuff with Salt Sisters. It's great, um, uh, get, it's great knowing you, and it's great getting to know you even at a deeper level. Over a breakfast we had a week ago, we had a breakfast a week ago, and we had a great time. And we're on a very, very similar page. There's a hair's breadth between us, so it seems. And um, anyway, I'm not going to take up your time. <laughs> Don't exactly. I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Just want to pray for you. Father, thank you so much that uh, Rafa is here. And Lord, you placed something on his heart to bring to this great bunch of people. And Lord, we just uh, pray that you will anoint him by the power of your Holy Spirit. And you will speak to our hearts and bring change to us in the mighty name of Jesus. And all the saints of God said, Amen. All right, well, thank you for having me, Pastor Chris. It is the first time I've ever spoken here at, it is the first time I've spoken here at the, the new building. Actually, I spoke at uh, TCF when you all used to be. You were in Kaji Zoa. It was just a small group of people. And I spoke there twice. I want to say it was like 98. 1998, yeah. Um, so I asked Pastor what I should speak on. He said, well, you can give your testimony. And I already know that. So it's like, that's no fun, you know, for me at least. I really love to talk about God's word. So that's what I would love to say. But I'll give you a little background. So um, my name is R-A-F. A E L Rafa Rafael Restrepo, and I was born in Colombia, South America. I was born at a very young age, very close to my mother. We lived on a second story empty lot. All right, that's it, that's all my testimony. Okay, we're done. I got saved when I was 19 years old. I grew up in the streets of New York, and that's where God reached me when I was a very rebellious young man. I have been pastoring since 1984, 83, 84. So that other means I started pastoring very, very young, or I'm a lot older than I look. I'll leave you with that. I'll leave you with that. Um, Pull out your phones, because I know you got your Bibles on your phones, so pull out your phones. I'm going to start here. We're going to just kind of ramble for about a half hour, and we're going to talk about Easter, all right? I mean, we're right here. This is this called Glorious Saturday. You don't know that because you're not Catholic, uh, and you probably don't go to the processions down in Cartagena that started last night, you know, but... Uh, in a Catholic country, Easter isn't Sunday. It starts well a week more, a week plus before it. So it's all about partying, okay? So we're just going to talk about uh, Easter for the next few minutes here. And um, I, um, I, um, I'm kind of doing this whole Easter thing back at uh, our congregation. By the way, the name of our church is International Christian Assembly. And we've been uh, here in Torrevieja since 2004. Um, anyway, <clears throat> and we're going to be talking about the glorious truth of Easter. So it's, the subject's just kind of been all in my head for the last uh, quite a few weeks and from the past. <clears throat> They've already prayed for me, so I'm going to assume that uh, the scripture's been blessed. Zechariah chapter 9 is the chapter where we get that verse that speaks about what we have sometimes called the triumphal entry. Zechariah 9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey and uh, we call it the triumphal entry 
Well, some would argue with that because it wasn't very triumphant. Um, he had a, a, a bit of an issue with the temple that day. And just a few days later, the crowd that was waving palms were saying, crucify him. And it just didn't end well. So some would wonder how triumphant that was. Let me read to you verse 10, which we sometimes just forget to read the context, okay? Let me read to you verse 10. Part of verse 10 says this, He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the end of the earth. Now that's a triumphant entry, is that not? Let me say to you something here, that Jesus is coming back. And that, my friends, will be the true triumphant entry. Um, our salvation, which sometimes we sort of, if you know Jesus is your savior, don't get stuck on that. That's just part of the great gift that God has given to you. Salvation comes with many, many, many things. The riches of Christ Jesus are very broad and very wide and very deep. And 1 Thessalonians 1.9, and this is why I'm saying it, says this, and you'll identify with the first part where it says, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That sounds like conversion, does it not? That sounds like when pagan us, lost us, were reached by a gracious God who chose to love us at that moment and to bring light to our hearts. But listen to the second half, okay? Verse 10, that uh, it says, we would turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and, see, it's part of that salvation, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. See, that second coming is part of your conversion experience, and you should be eagerly awaiting the true triumphant entry. There's a reason for that. Number one, it's because there's going to be a resurrection of all the believers. And uh, it takes a lot of explanation what all that means. But, uh, you know, sometimes we, we have this confusion what happens when a person dies. And I'm not going to get into that. It's just too long, too complicated. But know this, that in his second coming, there's going to be a resurrection of believers. Know that all injustice will be rectified. I have a very judicial heart, a very righteous kind of heart. Not, you, you would think that's a terrible thing. But I just like right and wrong. I'm really, I'm a very right and wrong person. So I live very frustrated, especially in the realm of politics. Very frustrated, you know. But, but God says that he's going to make all injustices, he'll rectify them, all unforgiven sin, is going to be punished. I always say it would be immorally horrible, immorally horrible if there would be no second coming. Because that would mean people all through the ages who have done horrible things would never be brought to, uh, to trial, to, to, to a just punishment for what they've done. But, but let me tell you another thing. All the forces of evil will be destroyed. You know that, right? I mean, we believe that good will triumph over evil, right? And, and the cross entitled Jesus the right to set in Satan to the lake of fire. That's what we're going to celebrate in a few days, the cross. The promised kingdom of peace is going to be a reality. Listen, folks, every time you go vote, which you should, we, we, we encourage you to, we don't tell you what to vote, at least not openly, but, uh, <laughs> well, you know, but, but, but know this, even I, who have this issue with right and wrong, know that no matter who I vote for, 
and still choosing the lesser of the two evils until his kingdom come. Then it will be a righteous kingdom. So that is the triumphant entry that I am expecting. You know what else happens? Ethnic, part of, a small part of ethnic Israel will be saved. And all the promises of God in that area will be fulfilled. And at last, Philippians 2 will be fulfilled. Where it says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that's the triumphal entry. But let me ask you a question. Let's talk for a minute about the garden. The garden in relation to his coming. You say, what does the garden, you know, uh, not the garden of Eve. I'm talking about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the garden, um, the, uh, what? Ah, thank you. I'm telling you, I need to retire. I'm, I'm just right there. The Garden of Gethsemane, you, 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 you know, you see it as this very, I, I, hear, I hear a lot of things, and a very dark moment in the life of Jesus and so on and so on. But if I said to you that in the garden, Jesus reveals his coming glory, God reveals the coming glory, that that triumphant glorious coming of Jesus in the garden. You would say, where? Okay, who's got, can, can we get up there, uh, Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 42 through 43. Luke 42, and uh, Luke 22, verse 42 and 43, and it says this. Jesus is speaking and he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Right? Three times, actually, he says that. Now, look at verse 43. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. We kind of skip over that, or we just simply sort of throw that under the, well, he was a man, he was... 100% God, 100% man, all man, all God. And, and the, the man part, the human part was really weak. And I, I don't have time to develop the whole idea, but uh, yeah, I don't think so. Jesus knew what was coming. He said it over and over and over what was coming. He told him to the detail what was coming. So have you ever asked yourself the question, what did the angel this messenger from God, what did he do? There's very little information, right? He says he strengthened him. And so that just really confuses us because the first question you should say to yourself is, I thought he was God. Does he really need strengthening? It's a little confusing. Did Jesus need physical strength? No, he didn't. And I can prove it. You'll have to come here one of my messages. I don't have time right now. So, so Jesus didn't need physical strength. To me, it's very evident. It didn't, he didn't need information. It's like, oh, by the way, let, um, God the Father sent me to tell you what's coming down the pike. I mean, he didn't need information. He knew everything. He didn't need wisdom. He didn't need encouraging. He didn't need courage to go through it. This is what happened. Read the scripture. It says the angel strengthened him, but don't stop right there. Read the next phrase. It says, it says the angel strengthened him. Then immediately after that, verse 44 brings this out. Being in agony, because he was in agony, right? Uh, the whole expression of the garden was his agonizing, okay? Um, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood. We, we, we focus on that, you know, well, what was it blood? Was it not blood? Was it just sweat? Did it just look, was it like grape juice? Well, you know, what, what, yes, because he had the, you know, they had had wine just a few hours earlier. But you missed the whole thing. The angel came to strengthen him, it says, and being in agony, 
he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood. What did the angel do? Because something, the angel did something that it's described as strengthening him. We can't take that away. But it made him pray more. And it made him agonize more. And it made him ask, take this cup from me. But we're not going to jump that far. I'm just going to stay with the angel. What did the angel do? I'd have to take you to Hebrews, where in Hebrews chapter 1, God explains what the position of the son is in relation to the angels. I'm just going to have to, you're just going to have to trust me that in Hebrews 1, 6, it says, let all the angels of heaven worship him. you know what that angel did? He did just that. That angel came to worship him. He said, why? Because he was in agony. Because he was agonizing over a particular issue. The nails? No. The crown? No. The blood lost? The whips? No. He was agonizing over your sin, over my sin, over the wrath of God that was about to come over him. And the angel came to do the one thing angels do with him, worship him. And you know what happened when he did that? He got strength. And he prayed more. And he agonized more. The worshiping angel is the father's messenger in a moment of profound humiliation to tell him the exaltation is coming. Read it in Ephesians 2. He, he became a man and lowered himself to the point of death only to be glorified to the point of authority at the right hand of the father. The angel was there to remind him what he already knew. The father was there to remind him what he already knew. On the other side, awaiting thousands upon thousands upon ten thousands of angels to worship you. But there had to be a cross. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 and 16. Galatians 6, 14 and 16. As you have that up there, I see how much fits in there. There you go. That's Genesis, uh, I, I, Galatians. It, it's in the New Testament. It was written by Paul. Some argue that it was his first letter. Anyway, while they get that up there, let me just talk about the glory of the cross. There was glory in that cross. And, and I, I want to talk about our, the cross from my perspective. What is Paul's perspective on that cross? As Jesus took upon himself the agony of God's wrath, our wrath on him, what, does, what is Paul's position or idea of that cross? Um, are we there yet? Okay, let me, let, me, let me read through it. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been cru crucified to me and I to the world. Verse 15, please. Uh, did we go through 15? We did, okay. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. So let me just run through this really quickly. Paul says, we are to glory in the cross. We are to glory in the cross. Yes, we are not ashamed, but to glory in it, you gotta know what it did 
Oh, they did so much. So I'm just only going to give you just a few things right out of these verses. The cross freed you from bondage. Verse 14, Paul says that the world is dead to me and I am dead to the world. That's what he said in verse 14. I'm free. The cross freed us from the bondage of the world. But it didn't just free me from the world, it freed the world from me. It went both ways. The cross did what the flesh couldn't do. That's number two. Now, he's writing to Galatians. He's writing to a church that's being affected by Judaizers. These are people that being Jews themselves want to uh, make the Christians become Jews again. By the way, that hasn't ended. It still exists today. You know, uh, they call them Messianic Jews. And some of them, uh, you need to understand this. You need to understand this that you as a Christian, you don't need anything from Judaism. Read the book of Galatians. Paul said, any other gospel, it's, 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 it's anathema. There's only one gospel. And Paul says, I've given you that gospel. And if anybody brings you another gospel, so they, they bring us back to the feast. And when they bring us back to all of this stuff from Judaism, and we're too scared to say, Hey, we got a book, an entire book that says that. You don't do that. And that's what he's saying, that the cross did what the flesh could not do, meaning the law. Judaism. It says, neither is circumcision anything, oh, and by the way, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So it's not about my denomination, my name, what I do, what I don't do. Is are you a new creation? Because the cross made the new creation possible. A new creation. The cross did what the flesh could not do. And number three, the cross has its benefits. Oh, yes, it does. Look at what he says in verse 16. And all who will follow this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. All who, what rule? The rule of we will glory in the cross. We will glory in the cross and nothing else. Upon that rule, Paul says, all who follow that rule, peace and mercy will be upon them. Peace means the relationship with God, that the relationship with God is right, and the resources of the cross are now available to you. You are at peace, and all of heaven's resources are yours. And then there's mercy. Mercy is very important, folks, because mercy is here to remind you you're still a person who sins. You're still a person who sins. You still, you, you may still be a child of God. You may have made peace with God, but perfection is still a wee bit off from you. And so mercy means that God will deliver whatever is necessary, whatever is needed to cover the misery that sin continues to bring even upon the one who belongs to God. So I need his mercy on a daily basis because I disappoint him. I have his peace and I have his mercy. That gets me through the day. Let me just finish with the idea of the resurrection. Um, because if there is glory in his return and there's glory in the garden and there's glory on the cross, you know there's got to be glory at the resurrection, right? Ooh, that's me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Las llaves tienen que estar en eso. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so the, we have to talk about the glorious resurrection. And I want to look at it a little bit from an apologetic point of view, from, from the apologetic point of view. 
the glorious resurrection. I want to read to you just a few verses out of Matthew 28. We don't read these verses too often because they're the bad guys. We don't like the bad guys, you know. But there's a reason why it's there. Matthew 28, verses 12 through 15. If I, if I can get Matthew 28, 12 through 15, please. I'd probably get it in my Bible quick. You tell me if it's up there. Oh, he, they beat me. They beat me. So when the chief priests met with the elders and devised the plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you ought to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. How important is that regarding the resurrection? There are a number of theories, many. Uh, I'm going to share six of them and then a seventh uh, on Sunday, but there's a lot of theories regarding the resurrection. But one of the theories is they stole his body. The disciples stole his body. Actually, it wasn't even, it, it, was, it was invented by them. And do you know what? It's the only one that's feasible. It, it's actually the most feasible one of all the ones that exist. But if you read the verses before that, it says that the soldiers went to the Sanhedrin to tell them. Now, what do you think they told them? Well, I think what they told them was, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, and then this happened, and we're here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little thought. We always say that the women were the first witnesses at the, from the grave side. Now, when the, when the women get there, you had to combine the Gospels for this. But when the women get there, the soldiers aren't sleeping. They're not, you know, knocked out. They're gone. That's why they were able to do what they did, because there were no soldiers there. Otherwise, they would have arrested them and taken them and said, you, you stole the body. So the soldiers are gone. Where are they? They're with the Sanhedrin. What are they telling them? Well, there was an earthquake, there was an angel, there was a rock, and then he was gone, and we kind of just fainted in the middle of the whole thing. So yes, Jesus did rise from the dead, and yes, there was an angel, an angel did come and shake, shook the earth, the, roll, the stone rolled away, they had terrified the Roman soldiers, they went into a coma, Jesus came out of the grave, it's all explained. They explained it to the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin said, mind your tongue. We got to come up with a better story than that. And so they came up with the, let's say they stole the body. Because any other, any other presupposition gets, to, gets knocked down really easy. Really easy, except this one. With one exception. The whole concept of the cover-up makes it all the more obvious. You know what? The first proclaimers of the resurrection were those soldiers. Did you notice what they did with the soldiers? You are to say, and they became the, the counter evangels of the gospel. They told them what to say. Say they, his disciples, came and stole the body, which they, they, that was the excuse to get the guards there in the first place. When you stop to think about that, you say, so it wasn't the women. It was his own enemies. They heard it first. They heard the news that something happened and he's no longer there. 
The cover-up makes it all the more obvious. I don't get a chance right now to elaborate on all, but I'll just leave you with that thought. Quite a few theologians have gone back to sort of play with this whole apologetic idea of the lie. So Jesus did rise. Does it matter? Does it really matter? I want to close with this verse. It's out of the book of Romans, Paul's theological treases. And in this chapter 10, as he speaks to the Jews, he says this. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You see, the resurrection is the only means to salvation. You have to confess with your mouth that it is true. And the scripture says you shall be saved. Saved from the wrath of God. Saved from uh, eternal separation from God. Saved from the punishment of daily sin in your life. You need... If you have not made peace with God, you need salvation. And salvation comes from understanding that all of the glorious moments of the week that is about to be celebrated culminate in a big lie that proves that he rose from the dead. And that it, anyone that chooses to believe in his heart that God raised them from the dead shall be saved. And I trust you have made peace with God while you still can. Easter week is a wonderful week to meditate, to think, to say thank you, to wish and want to understand all of the quiet aspects of this coming week. I trust that as a believer, you revel in that truth. And if you're not, do not ignore the resurrection because it isn't until you admit it and receive it and embrace it that salvation, true salvation, will be visited upon your heart by God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. It is just awesome. There's never enough time, Father. It is too deep. It is too broad. And it is just too awesome. But when we lean into it for a little while, our hearts are left with gratitude that one day in the middle of our sin, middle of our waddling in the mud, for some reason, you chose to love us. To pull us out of that miry pit. To place our feet upon the rock of the Lord Jesus. To give us, Father, that gift of salvation. Thank you. Thank you for this coming week, Father. May we, as your children, be ever so uh, focused and meditate upon the truths of the events pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Pastor. Well, let's show our appreciation to Ralph and my goodness. Thank you, brother. Bless you. Do you know, I've um, been a Christian for, oh, crumbs, I don't know, 38 years or more, 40. Ooh. And that's giving my age away a bit. But there's always something new to learn about this story, isn't there? About the truth of the gospel, about the truth of what happened. There's always a different way of looking at it. There's always a different insight into it. I don't know about you, but I've learned a lot, and I've really enjoyed it. And, you know, when you learn these things, you suddenly realize, actually, I did know that, but I never saw it quite that way before. And that really builds a passion in our hearts for the truth of what has happened, which we're about to celebrate this week. Thank you so much for coming. It's been absolutely brilliant. We'll definitely see you again. Uh, everyone, I'm going to close with prayer, and uh, you're free to go. And uh, 
members, associate members, back here for what time? Two o'clock, you've got it. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this time. It's been just so wonderful to meet together and to have a refreshing view of all that you have done uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And especially, we believe in the resurrection, do we not?